certainly appreciate you agreeing to meet with us and hang out for a little time. We don't know how long we're going to have with you, so we certainly want to make the most of your time. I think we have like 12 guys here. Um, our viewers cannot uh, see up, my pick. Is man? that correct? Oh, no, you're good. I'm not sure. I don't know what anybody can see. I can see you. Really? But, uh, then there's 12, 13 of us, 13 of us and, and a couple of youngsters. It's, it's great. We had an RL party, and then uh, after this, we're going to hit the road and, and um, go to a local uh, parking lot, do some riding a little bit. We'll get some video of that and send it in. That's nice, man. I wish I was there with you guys. Yeah. Likewise. Well, that, that might be a question here in a little bit. <laughs> we might make that happen. <laughs> We actually contemplated flying in and not telling you. And we were going to just knock on your door and Dylan and I were going to walk in. Well, hold on. You, you weren't planning on bringing Pat? Well, if Pat wants to come, he's got a NASCAR and a guitar <laughs> going, but he's here right now. What's Is up, Mike? He okay. can't see us. Well, Ariel, I got to tell you, you're welcome to stay. We appreciate you being here, but we really just want to talk to Pat. So, <laughs> <laughs> you do what you He's right here, man. Hey, Mike, what's going on? Just want to say you gotta hi. Talk, you got to hold it. What's going on? Meeting Pat is like when, uh, when uh, Marsha Brady met Johnny Bravo. I believe it was episode six, season eight. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's cool, man. I know. It's nice to meet you. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. That's cool, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks, man. You're cool too. Me and RL talk about you all the time, and you guys too, man. You're you're great. You're like you're man, you're really you're. you're no, nah, you're cool, man. No, that's the truth, man. You're like you're funny, and uh, you bring a lot of lot of um, entertainment to all this stuff online, which is really cool. Totally, totally. Well, I, th I think we all have uh, something that we can. We can achieve something. And I got to say, RL, in all seriousness, I'm not trying to get too deep too early, but what, what you have done to impact our lives, and I can say this for all these guys here who, who will eventually speak for themselves, but um, I don't know that you know how much you have impact, impacted our lives. I think that I speak very clearly for the bulk of BMX community, freestyling community, that, um, um, you know, there's there's really not words to say for the impact that you've made in our lives. And, and so on behalf of all of the BMX community, thank you very much. Well, thank you guys. I mean, sincerely appreciate that very much. But, um, you know, I have the same feeling for you guys because if you guys weren't riding and stuff like that, we wouldn't be doing shows and traveling. So um, you guys mean the same to me. I really, and that's a true, honest statement. question but you really do seem to have a certain sense of humility about you very down to earth and I'm wondering and have been wondering where does that come from well I don't know if it's humility uh what, what do you call humility? it humility yeah, I don't have a hard time saying that myself. it's just the truth man I mean you know I wouldn't be doing shows if I didn't have anybody to do shows for right if you guys if you guys didn't get into it, there wouldn't be a sport. So that's just the truth, man. That's the way I've always seen it. And um, you guys are as big, big a part of this as me, at least, if not more. So I, I don't, that's just kind of being honest. Coming back on the stage after the after the last song, 
and just hammering it out and, and your seamless and yet very slow moving in uh, is kind of an example maybe for others who we hope that will come back on the scene. I hope others are watching that because there is this limelight thing that I know you could embrace that. You could probably make a bunch of money and, um, and the fanfare would still be there. But the way that you're coming in, I believe, really sets the tone for others. And again, I'll say it a thousand times tonight, but, but thank you not only for your contribution, but for your re-contribution and uh, bringing it back, almost a resurrection of sorts. We're, we're just blessed to be a part of it, truly. Well, man, that's a that's a huge compliment that I'll remember forever. I really appreciate that. But, um, yeah, you know, I see us as friends. Uh, everybody that I talk to, I see us as friends. We're sharing stories. I'm, I talk to guys every day, and we're just talking about bikes and how to get this built, and um, people are helping me with ideas and stuff like that. So, I, you know. I think it's funny you guys want my autograph, truthfully, because I, I just look at us as we're doing the same thing. But, you know, if, if that makes you happy, I'll do it, you know? Yeah, well, it does. It absolutely does. Well, here's the thing, man. Um, we could stay here all night, and you would probably stay on all night, and we could ask some really goofy questions. And there's no way that I'm going to be able to ask all the right questions. There are going to be some people out there and BMX land who are going to be disappointed, no doubt. So I'm just going to kind of shoot from the hip. And what I have decided to do, maybe a little bit unorthodox, but instead of asking you direct questions, what I would like to do is maybe bring up some subjects and then listen to you talk on those subjects. And as questions kind of organically come to surface, uh, then we would kind of maybe approach those questions. And again, I've got several guys here who may or may not ask questions. I guess time will have a lot to do with that. Um, but again, I, I think you're kind enough to stay on and, and answer questions, but I don't know that those are the th things that you want to talk about. And so I believe that most people want to hear what you want to talk about. It probably isn't the horse race, um, or maybe it is. I don't want to speak for you, but I, I think that you would probably speak on it, but I imagine that there are other things that you want to you want to talk about in fact the other day if i remember correctly you asked me if i was going to ask the wimpy questions or i was going to get down to business right right so let's go back to the very beginning maybe even pre-bmx you decide that if you want i'm wondering what was it like for rl osborne um maybe again even pre-bmx what was it like growing up southern california scene uh, in the home of famed BMX magazine creator Bob Osborne. What was childhood like for you? Um, so, um, well, there's there's stages before that that happened in, you know, um, writing and stuff, but um, I'll talk about the magazine. Um, it was just, uh, you know, my dad and I kind of got into racing or I was in I was doing a lot of riding by myself with my friends and stuff and, and my dad would watch and then um, we heard somebody put a track together and we went and did that um, but yeah it was cool man um, when the magazine started I mean it definitely took everything to a new level it brought it just brought notice to everybody and they brought all these iconic pictures and stuff and and we had I mean to me like Tom Lund came to my house one time um, and he's an old school guy, but that, that was like pretty much God walking into my living room. Jimmy Weinert won the Super Bowl of motocross. He came into my house right after that. That was pretty mind boggling. You know, all the, all the guys that were like the big pros, John Paul from Byron Friday, Bobby and Cenas. Anytime those guys were around, it was pretty, pretty cool. But yeah, it was neat. Yeah. I have no idea, no idea. I I was um. Let's see. Um. I don't know. I don't know. I don't really log anything by years, or I just go by memory type. But I don't know. Yeah, we look back at magazines, and we thought. I again speaking for myself, and for many others, we just can't imagine you being a kid. You know, you always seem larger than life and um, very mature. 
um, a very much an ambassador for the sport. It was almost like you were created for the purpose. Thank you. And Thank you. It truly. And so, and so here's a question for you, kind of segueing from that. You mentioned that Bob Haro lived in your home. How in the world did that happen? What was that like? Well, Bob was this insane artist, and he was doing these drawings. And... Um, and uh, they, my dad and him made a deal. He was going to be an artist for the magazine, and he was going to live with us. And uh, Bob and I and all my friends, who became Bob's friends too, we used to go surfing together every day. Uh, we'd always eat at this Mexican restaurant called Roses. And um, it was cool. Bob was very entertaining. We fought like brothers at times, but, you know, when you're living together, that's going to happen. Um but he had a car. He was old enough to drive, and I wasn't. So <laughs> it was good. He was uh, He's a creative guy, man. And then he was doing his number plates, too, which was big. Um, yeah, it was a big thing to get in the old days to get just a regular number plate, and Bob would cut out the numbers and put them on the plate. This is before the years. And all the pros ran his plates. And so that was a big thing. Yeah, so that, that started out as... Um Plates. Yeah, probably. And then, then he changed it to Haro, and that kind of just took off. Yes. Right? Yeah. So, so uh, I, I'm just suspecting that BMX Action was your first sponsor, surely. Um, no, I was uh, before. I used to break handlebars I, when I was riding the Schwinn. Right, I break handlebars, and I always take them to this place in Redondo Beach. Her name was Paulina. And um, she'd scream at me like, what are you doing to those bikes? And why are you breaking everything? I'm like, I don't know, but they're broken and I need new bars, you know. And my dad would stand back and he let me fight it. I was like eight or nine. And about the fourth time I went into her um, Schwinn bike shop, she said she wanted to sponsor me, which was a change. You know, she's going to change my bars out and sponsor me. There's a lot of there's a lot that went on before the magazine of just kids riding, you know, um, but that was one of the things that had gone on. Um, when I was like five, I was riding bicycles from four to five and motorcycles in there. And um, the, the Souls family, they used to ride bikes and do wheelies up and down the street. Uh, this guy named Mark Nearing used to ride a Honda Elsinore and do wheelies on his motorcycle. and I just wanted to emulate that so bad. Wow. But there was kids before me that were riding wheelies around the block, you know? I mean, so this goes way before me. But, um, yeah, we were just doing jumps and stuff, and it was great. And then when the magazine came out, it just uh, it just took the sport, and it really, um, it actually made it a sport. You know, the quality that they put into that magazine. Um, my dad was a freak about quality. He just wanted that thing perfect, and it showed you know sure it did show sure yeah yeah so so here you are watching guys doing willies on motorcycles and, and bicycles and, and that kicked off you mentioned the, the rock walk uh, watching Bob do that and so that, I'm just suspecting that was one of the first tricks that you've seen on a bicycle no um, it was the first like like that really made a big difference I mean people I tell tell us all the time. Way before um, when I was like six, I was riding these uh, wood jumps that I'd make. My dad and a neighbor were sitting on their bars, handlebars backwards, riding the bike. You know what I mean? And um, and there was kids doing wheelies, you know, um, jumping off curbs. We were starting to do one eighties off curbs and stuff like that. But when it all came together, Bob Harrow came to our house and he did a rock walk, and that was like. That was like a bomb going off. That was big. And he was also trying to do a 180 and roll backwards. And he was close to pulling it and eventually did. But that's where the that's where things kind of came together. But um, yeah, the new the riders that were before in BMX, the early riders, they were contemplating 360s off jumps. Um, they were working on some crazy stuff, trying different things. You know what I mean? So you could see this kind of coming. And um, nobody really thought about freestyle until Bob did those two tricks. And that was the opening. And he did a curb endo, too. 
And then we started riding. Yeah. We started riding at a place called Dunkin' Donuts, me, Bob, and a bunch of friends. And we'd ride there every night because there was a bank. And uh, it just grew from there. Yeah. How cool is that? Yeah. That's so awesome. Everybody has a beginning, right? Yeah. Every, there's a beginning. But, man, if you really, you know, like Pat Romano, I went, I was in Vegas with Pat Romano when he was, when we were riding together. And he had a brother that must have been 35 that was doing those tricks that Pat did. He was riding in Circus Circus and had been doing it a long time. So Pat Romano and, and the way that they rode, I think that was going on for a long time, you know. Um, so if you really get into the research of guys doing tricks on bicycles, it goes back to those big wheel bikes with a little wheel in the back, you know. Um, yeah, well, no doubt. No doubt. Yeah. We've got, we've got a big wheel bike out here in the, in the yard right now. We're going we're gonna to see if we can ride some wheelies here a little bit. Cool. <laughs> yeah, so let me ask you, do you ever get nostalgic? Like we get nostalgic. I mean, right. from, from everything from seeing a bike, like like when Dustin rode in a few minutes ago or a couple hours ago on his Kuahara, like this euphoric, nostalgic emotion ran over me. And most people have something that resembles that. But what do you get nostalgic about in particular when it uh, concerns BMX? Well, I have a really big place in my heart for all the guys that I used to race with well they, they were, I was like nine and there was pros that were racing BMX and those guys I remember watching Bobby and seeing us wheelie over a jump for the first time can you imagine that speed jumping for the first time you, these guys were just Paul Furman Tom Lund Billy Wuda Marvin Church built the first triangle frame I think these were big these were big things but when um, I forgot his name the guy came by with his wife and he brought that red general. I, I remember that. Right. Remember the- and up until that point, I thought you guys were nuts, man. I'm like, what are you guys doing building all these old bikes? I didn't get it. But when I sat on that bike, man, it was like a, it was like a time machine. It was like I could just it seemed like time had stopped and I'd gone back in time. And then I oh, wow. then I got what you guys were doing. And um, but sitting on that bike was the first time I really got nostalgic, I guess you would say. We've got one of those. We've got an, uh, an Osborne Pro here that is absolutely beautiful. It's the gray one. I think you're building the gray one um, for um, for Eric. It's right there. Yes, yeah. it's right. You can't see it, huh? It's yeah, right. I can't see it. That's it's too behind bad. you there. Yeah, yeah, someone was telling me. Um, so, so you and I have a mutual friend. I just mentioned his name. His name is Eric Wolf. Oh, you know Eric? I do. Oh, really? Kind of, kind of a small world the way that happens. I was talking to him on the phone this week, and um, for those out there in BMX world who do not know, Eric has stomach cancer. He was in the hospital when I was talking to him just this week, and um, I told him I was going to throw him under the bus, so I'm going to throw him under the bus. He had a question for you about Redline, and we're going to kind of segue into, into your thoughts on Redline, but Eric asked the question he said i've done a ton of research on redline and nowhere in redline discussion like literal redline discussion is there a mention of rl osborne and so i just threw him under the bus um and he was wondering why that is who what do you mean there's no discussion who who is having an in this? Uh, on the redline site you can go into the red oh right site. i can't tell you, you why that is history. There's a reason. There's okay. a big reason behind that, which I can't say. But I, <laughs> I, that. I will tell you this, that Lynn asked me if he could put my name on a bike. And I said, I would love to have my name on a bike. And that's where the RL20 and the RL22 came from. Lynn Caston being the original owner of Redline. So um, the reason why they didn't print that was... Um, other reasons that had nothing to do with me but some people didn't it's a long story but yeah it, it is my name and that was a choice of Lynn Caston's so well I told uh, I told Eric I would mention it so he's he's in fanboy mode right now as well so yeah Eric and I talk quite a bit and um, 
He's a trip. He's a good guy, man. He, he was talking to me and I could hear the nurses and I go, what are you doing? He goes, I'm getting a blood transfusion for my surgery. And he's talking to me on the phone and we're talking about bikes. I'm like, okay. Yeah, but he's cool. I really like him. Sorry, Mike. Mike, can I interrupt you a second? Sure. Hold on. Tell him if he pulls up the stream on Facebook, he'll be able to see you guys through that. And then he can well, remember, the I, I, my Facebook has been... Oh, has that's been, right. Uh, Never mind, yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Down, yeah. That's one of his friends has it. He heard, you heard that, Mike? Yes, sir. You heard Dylan say that? I, I just heard him in your background. Good. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, um, there's a guy that, I'm going to tell you, this is what really turns me on lately. This guy posted a picture of a hazard yellow updated red line. And it looks like a four inch head tube. And he's got a small sprocket on it. And he's cleaned up a few things on it. And man, that looks really tasty to me. That updated red line really gets me going. I mean, I love the old red lines, you know. Um, I love the swelled out rear end. It's such a quality bike, you know, but um, the updated thing, because, you know, I really I'm riding, you know, so I want to ride these bikes. Um, but that you hazard yellow updated red line really turns me on. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. But the old ones too. seeing these old ones that are just like really clean. They're like, you know, time period. Correct. Everything is just right on. They're just it's like a piece of art. You know, they're just beautiful. Did you have any, um, did, were your fingerprints on the 20 or the 22? In the design? Yes. Absolutely. Um, oh. The 20, I had gone to Lynn Casson and said, can we make a freestyle bike? Here's how it would go. He, he had an engineer, his name was Gene, and Lynn and I would sit in the office and I would tell him what I needed. And then Lynn would figure out how to make, make it look good and clean. And then Gene, the engineer, if I, I hope I said his name right, would say whether or not it would work or not. And there was a lot of arguments in there because, <laughs> you know, a lot of things will work that an engineer will tell you that they won't. But he had a big hand in it. So it was a combination of all of us um, on both bikes. Yeah, I can see it. Can you, if you see hold that? it towards the camera screen? They can see it too if you want to show it to them. What? And then, and then the 20. Like this? Yeah. But you can see what they're seeing. So. Oh, can you guys see that? Yeah, I think they might be able to see that a little bit. Okay. Okay. I was just showing your bike, but. Nice. Yeah, so so what, what did you like better, the, the 20 or the 22? I'm just going to. Well, no, no. the the 20, you know, it was the first one that came out, you know, and, and the head, Lynn made the head angle way too steep, and that was really uncomfortable. But after two weeks, man, I was loving Lynn because that made the trick so much easier, you know. Um, but the 20 was kind of, I don't know if that was the first actual freestyle bike that came out, but I just love that bike. Um I would prefer to ride a 22 because I like the double top tube. You know what I mean? And the swelled, the swelled out rear tail. But um, there's so much work in that thing. Tapered tubes and the way it wraps around the head and those tight bends. I mean, it, that, that bike was before its time. The 20 was and so was the 22. Redline ad, the 8420, and you, you're crouched down behind that. By the way, I should have worn it, but I have the jersey, I have the jacket, I have the shoes. Really? I'm working on the jeans, and I'm working on the curly hair. <laughs> <laughs> I, have this, I have this plan to recreate that. Yeah. <laughs> I had kind of just put it in my head that 
one day I would own both, and, and now, as you see, I do. And I absolutely love them. I, I love riding that 22, even though I'm much shorter than you. It, it just has so much room. It's like riding a Cadillac. Yeah. Yeah, and, you know, I'm learning as, you know, as measuring this general behind me and the angle of the seat post opens up a lot. Of, there's advantages to new the new um, style of ride, not the really short bikes, but like my S and M. There's advantages to the old way and the new way, the new styles. Um, and I'm learning that. The more I ride, I just keep learning more about the geometries. And um, hopefully one day I'll be able to, I'll come out with something that's uh, kind of the best of both worlds. But it'll probably cater a little bit more to the old school. Even just uh -huh. earlier today, I was riding a new school bike. One of these guys here has a new school bike. And I was riding that, and then I jumped on, I don't know, something else that was 85, we'll say. Yeah. And it was it's just night and day. And, and hats off to you guys. And, of course, I know you get used to whatever you get used to riding. Right. Uh, you, you've worked with what you had to work with. But nonetheless, to ride some of those bikes now and think of doing tricks... It's just night and day. I have a suspicion that there are those new new school guys who would pick up what you guys rode, what we rode, and couldn't even begin to do the quality of tricks that they're doing. So, so what you did in your day, people I believe probably do understand, was well before its time. And um, yeah, it's, of course we we still try to mimic that today. But I appreciate yeah. that. I really appreciate that. You know and. And it's it's really cool having the new school coming back into this because they're teaching me a lot about the old school, you know, and and what what all those riders came up with and how I see it in their riding today. But I mean, the new school have definitely taken care of their own. Right. They're doing unbelievable stuff. But it also makes me appreciate the ramp riders, the ground riders, the street riders and everything that was done back in the day was was pretty good, you know. Yeah. Pretty amazing yeah. stuff. Yeah, we can even watch some of the videos. Um, no offense, but as corny as maybe the choreography was in some of those old videos, yeah, the, the tricks were absolutely awesome. You know, and and that's how that's how we developed into um, to writers ourselves was mimicking what you did. Most of us didn't have our own tricks. We just tried to do what we saw in magazines, and of course in some of the Saturday morning commercials, and then um, ob obviously Rad. Can we yeah. talk about Rad for a minute? Sure. Talk about your contribution to Rad. Um, you weren't in the movie. You were obviously in the in the um, the intro and the outro. Um, that wasn't a slight to you in any way. There were lots of guys who weren't in, in the movie, but um, how do you feel about that? How do you feel about the movie and, uh, and your contribution? Well. Um, do you want the whole story? I want as much as you want to talk about. <laughs> so um, I had been touring. Yes, we want the whole story. I was on tour with Ronnie Wilton, and we had been all over uh, Switzerland. We'd been back, back and forth to there a bunch of times. We were going across. I'd been on the road for like, I don't know, most of seven years. And I was wow. one day, I was we were in our hotel room. I was just sitting in the tub. And uh, and I had a, my manager called me, who was a lady that worked at the magazine. Her name was Darlene Lear. She's just just a great woman. She passed away, but she was uh, just a fantastic woman. But um, she told me that they wanted me to go to Canada for three months to do the movie Rad and be involved in you know teaching the guys how to talk and ride and writers and stuff like that. And I, I turned it down. Because I was just so burned out, I just I didn't plug that in, charge it. Oh, hold on a second, Mike. Yeah. Um. And you know she was pissed <laughs> that I turned it down, but you know when you're on the road that you that much, and you're just on airports. Mike and I used to live in airports, and I was just done, man. I needed some time off, you know. And um, they called me back. It, during my tub, we had three phone calls back and forth, and I finally just said, you know, I, I, they made me a really nice offer, and I just, I said, I can't do it. I can't do it, you know. And um, they went to Eddie, as far as I knew, they went to Eddie Fuel after that. Uh, maybe Eddie was already talking to him. I don't know. 
but that's how my part of it went. Um, yeah, and I, I, I regret that I, I'm glad I took the time off, but I, I kind of wish I would have, would have been involved because I could see areas where maybe I could have helped a little bit. Um, but that's how that went. No, there's no regrets. In fact, I shouldn't have said regret about Rad. Um, I, I mean, I wish I could have been there to, to maybe teach the writers, you know, how we really talk, you know, because we had our own language, you know that. Sure. And, um, you know, how to ride a bike so they, they look like they were riding a bike and like yeah, they could, this is true. This is you true, know. Yeah. But um, I know D Eddie did a really good job there. Um, but no, you know, walking away from from that offer that they'd given me, um, taught me that this was more important to me than money, you know? And so I learned a good lesson about myself there, walking away from the sport because I had to deal with myself that if I was ever doing it only for the money, I would walk away out of respect for the sport because I love the sport. It was my, it was my everything. By walking away, it was kind of just paying tribute, going, I'm just not going to abuse you anymore in a way, just for the money. And I learned a lot about myself um, in that time. Yeah, that's huge. What, what an example for all of us. It was huge. It was, it was brutal to walk away from it. But, um, you know, and I knew it would be hard for people to understand. And... I did get a phone call from someone, I can't remember his name, but he said on the phone, he wanted, he, he goes, did you ever think about all the people that were following you and then you just left? And I told him, honestly, no, I never considered myself a person that people followed. So I just thought we were all friends, you know, and I go to these shows and I'd see my friends. I never thought about anybody following me. But when he said it that way, if I would have thought about that more I would have, maybe I would have done it different. You know what I mean? I, hindsight's twenty twenty, and Right. And, and let's just be honest, we all left. At some point, we all left. Yeah. And, uh, and don't be too hard on yourself, because we all make those decisions, whether it be leaving BMX or leaving relationships, and there's a reason why the, the windshield is bigger than the rear view mirror, you know? Uh, right. What's in front of us is, is what is most important. And I do want to eventually, here in just a few minutes, hit on the future. But let, let me, uh, so we talked about red line. When I mention the word general, what comes to mind? Can Not I? Not just bike, can, but touring, uh, sponsorship, the whole nine yards. Can I say one more thing about red line? Um, Please do. Okay. You know, Stu Thompson, Dee Dee Leone, John Anderson, Scott Clark. There was all these amazing riders on that team. You know what I mean? And, I, and sure. so... That was one big attraction, but Lynn Caston, um, the quality that he wanted to put out and the things he taught me about the ramps he built for us, and um, that was that was everything to me. That was red line with that team and Lynn Caston. That was my whole connection there. That's and that's why you know, and you guys can see because you're still this bike is still a really good bike, you know. So that's those are those were my big draws to that team, and I was lucky to be a part of it. When when we think of uh, Redline, we, we think of R.L. Osborne. You know, well, thank Obviously, you. That's on the freestyle end. When we when we think of race, we think of Stu Thompson and, and uh, a host of others. But yeah, I think when most think of freestyle, they think of Redline and they think of of R.L. Osborne. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. So bully, talk to talk to us about bully. General. General. Okay, so um, the industry was changing and um, Redline was going through difficulties, you know, because um, we, we were going through our first cycle in freestyle. Right. And um, so Redline and I had separated and um, there happened to be a bike show in Reno 
And a friend of, my, friend of mine, Fred Blood, was riding for a bike company called General. Yeah, we've heard of him. Yeah. I, I hope you know, man, that guy is God on roller skates. He was okay. doing... He was doing stuff on, you know, four-wheeled roller skates at Runway at, was it runway or whatever the skate park was in Marina. He was doing 540 Canyons when we were just starting to ride skate parks. He was ahead of his time. Yeah, there are videos of, of Fred out there, skinny as a rail, and um, it, it, what he did was absolutely amazing. But yeah, so he was touring with, uh, with General already, correct? I don't know if he was touring, but he had he had found them and he had got them going and he was putting they were they had a good connection. Fred is um, he knows how to get things done. He's a sharp guy. Okay. Um, Fred and I were friends for a long time. Um, but anyways, I showed up this Reno show and he goes, what are you doing here? Because I hated going to those like, you know, Anaheim and all those things. I just hated those things. And I said, well, I'm not riding for Redline anymore. And he was like, oh, you got to talk to these guys at General. And I think I met Harry Myers and um, Chet and maybe a couple other people. And we started talking. I was actually talking to Schwinn at the same time. And um, I chose to go with General. So you were talking to Schwinn to right. maybe go tour with or, or sponsor with Schwinn? Schwinn and General were... Um, were uh, they wanted me pretty bad, which is a really good feeling, you know, after losing a ride with Redline. Um, it was really nice to be wanted. And um, and I had good relationships with the people at Schwinn. I'd, t- I'd been talking to them forever, um, just just friends with them. But, um, yeah, I chose to go with General. And, man, they were a good company. They let me get really involved. And Harry Myers is just – Harry Myers, I don't know if you know him or not, but he's the best, man, straight shooter. Uh, yeah. General over Schwinn, and that's that's maybe that's that's almost a slight. I don't mean for it to, but but the the general bike is off the hook. I'm looking at one literally as we speak, and uh, yeah, good decision. The the Osborne Pro is a. I don't think I could uh, get into a Schwinn uh, RL Pro. I don't know. Maybe I could. <laughs> you know <laughs> the never know, will we? <laughs> the Osborne Pro, man. I was so that bike and I were just like one. It, I was so comfortable on that bike, you know, just like the red line. I never thought I would get that feeling about a bike after not riding for Link Cast in a red line. But the general just, man, it was like one of those bikes you just don't have to think about. It's just right with you, you know. Wow. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Um, let's talk about touring. When you think about touring, um, what are your thoughts? What, was it, was it um, something you enjoyed? And uh, would you speak to it at whatever extent you would like to? Um, everybody I toured with had different Todd Anderson, Ronnie Wilton. They all had unique personalities, which was really cool. It kept it entertaining. And I learned stuff from all of them, you know, Chris Rothrock. But man, if you're going to tour, go with Mike Buff. You just got to go with Mike Buff and Dana Duke because those guys are. Uh, Man, you're going to need that entertainment. It's kind of they're kind of like you, you know, very entertaining no matter what they're doing, and you need that side when you're on the road all the time. Uh, you're answering some of my questions a little prematurely. We, we are going to have a speed round here in, in a little bit as we kind of segue towards uh, an exit. But um, some of these guys have some questions. Cool. That are with I'm going to have them to kind of step forward again. You can't see them, so it's not necessary for them to be in front of the camera. And then I'm going to come back, ask a few serious questions, and then do a um, speed round. That's cool. Can I mention something real quick? Absolutely. Um, so the other night, this is totally off the subject, but Pat, I told you guys he plays guitar. Yes. And Pat's a sandbagger. I want you guys to know that. He tells me, like, yeah, I know a little bit. Yeah, I know a few chords, but... <laughs> Then when we start talking, he's like, he knows everything, right? So I'm like, anyways, he sent me a video uh, Friday night of him playing the blues on stage live. And I didn't even know it was him, man. I thought, I'm like, who is this guy? I never even heard of this guy. And then I looked up and I noticed it was Pat. We're going to post that. And you guys can see what he does with a guitar. And it's it's blues, but man, it's it'll blow your mind. So, so the Pat that. that you work with, 
Yes. But then he puts a cape on, and when he puts his cape and mask on, something crazy happens. Yeah, he's like he is like <laughs> humble beyond humble, and that he's moved into the level of what I call a sandbagger, where they're like, um, you know, it's like one of those guys that goes, no, I never water skied before, and they get out there and they're doing backflips, you know. Right. He, yeah, he's like that, and. I've been working with him for over, what, a year and a half now? Yeah, about a year, a year and a half. half. Yeah. And, man, he says stuff and answers questions and figures things out, and I'm just like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm starting to believe he's like a scientist for NASA or something. But the other night, the uh, the guitar question all came together, man, and it was just another big yeah. reality I check. That, man. Thank you. But, uh, all right, um, who's, who's got questions? Brent, We're going to post that, too. Yeah, that's cool. Hey man, who am I talking to? This is Brent Schulze, big fan of yours. Brent, how you doing, man? Good, I'm doing good. I can't see your I can't see your face. Pipeline or Del Mar at Skate Ranch or any of that? Pipeline. Um, no, I didn't ride Pipeline. I rode in Marina Del Rey, Torrance, Lakewood, um, kind of the skate parks before those. But not Pipeline. So what kept you from entering any of those King of the Skate Park concerts, uh, contests just out of curiosity? Well, I was riding, um, I was riding parks a lot, and I was riding um, Lakewood. And this little kid came. His name was Mike Dominguez. And <laughs> yeah, we heard of him. Yeah. Man, he <laughs> progressed so fast. And he goes, I remember he rode by me at like, 13 or something mm-hmm. he goes he said just wait mike's a man of few words and i saw him in del mar like 12 feet out of these bowls and i'm like well <laughs> i think i'm done with skate parks him and brian and eddie fiola were just they just took it so far and so high and so good and smooth that um i was like well i don't think there's really anything i can do here you know <laughs> And, uh, and so I want and I decided to concentrate on, I still rode overall, you know, that used to be a big thing. You ride ground and ramps and I like doing, I like doing overall. I won some contests in the overall, but man, when you see Mike, Eddie and Brian and then Ron Wilkerson, all those guys, Josh White, you see him ride and it's like, man, I don't want to ride against those guys. They're just freaking out of this world, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, um, overall riding was kind of fading out and I was and I decided to concentrate on one thing that I really wanted to do well as best as I could. And um, Flatland was kind of that was kind of my um, that's kind of the original thing where this all started. That was where my heart was. And man, the ramp riders were just doing ramps justice, you know, and more justice than I could do. Um, And I rode with these guys for a long time, but. Um, they were just, man, they were progressing so fast. I decided to go with ground and I was starting to get a little bit older probably. And just constant. And that was a really good move. I thought, I didn't think anybody would sponsor me just being on ground and it didn't make any difference at all. Wow. Very cool. Awesome. Thank you. Sure. My pleasure. Nice meeting you. Is this Mark, the guy I've been talking to online? It, it is. He's my Pat. I'm Pat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm bigger, What's I'm going on? Pat. Hey, Mark, how you doing, He's man? Big fan, Pat. He's sidekicks, man. Right on. You got it, brother. Right. You got it, man. <laughs> I, I, I was telling Clubhome Boy, you know, such a, uh, such a iconic uh, piece of BMX history. Uh, what does Clubhome Boy mean to you? I know that uh, you're one of the original guys from what I've read of uh, Club Homeboy. Um, I'd just like to hear what it means to you. Man, um, you know, that was, I think, Lou and Andy, Mark Lumen, and uh, I can't remember Andy's last name, but he was the bass player in Milk. And he also worked for the, he was the art guy for um, BMX Action for a long time. They were, that was kind of their thing, you know? 
And um, I I didn't know that much about it, really. I mean, I, I knew they were doing it and they were extremely creative. And um, I, I didn't really, uh, I don't know. I, that's all I really knew about it. I didn't, how many issues came out? Right. Uh, conditions and putting the stickers everywhere, and then people would see them and kind of was want to, you know, just kind of blew up from there. Um, but I just, I was really curious on, you know, how, it, you know, if that played a big part in your career or not. Um, you know, I, I remember it happening, and I know Mark, and, you know, um, I don't know if Jeff Tremaine happened to be in that. I think it was more Andy and Lou. Um, it was very creative, and I think they were trying to bring kind of some fashion back into it, like skateboarding and stuff, and um, a little more of a hard edge. And I really liked it. Um, I just didn't know that much about it, probably because I was so absorbed in BMX action and freestyling. Cool. I appreciate it. And uh, uh, Dylan, Pat, keep it up, guys. You guys are kicking butt. Yeah, man, you're doing a good job for Mark. Uh, for, uh, Mike. Yeah. Mike. You are, man. Yeah, it's good to have you there. You guys are kicking back, too. He needs your help. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's awesome, man. Uh, Jason, do you have a question? Uh, not right now, not yet. <laughs> if they stand behind you, Mike, I can see them. He said if you stand behind me, you can, you can see. You can see. He can see. All right, it's Fred again. I got one more question. Sure. Uh, Yeah. It was kind of uh, up to the minute, and it just made a big difference seeing that video and seeing all the different tricks and the pros in that commercial. That was a big deal for us. I don't know if you were aware of that, but do you have any memories about making that commercial? I do. I could tell you. Um, yeah, it was really cool because Ron Wilkerson, Eddie Fiola, me, I think Pat Romano was probably in it. Yeah. Um, so they told us at the end of the commercial – they had this lake and a jump, and they said you get one jump. That's it, one shot, right? <laughs> and I, I got to go before Eddie, which was good because Eddie's really good off jumps. And I pulled that 360, right? And Eddie rolled by me. He goes, "You son of a bitch!" And uh, <laughs> he was gonna do that too. So he's like, he was gonna try a backflip, you know? And um, it didn't work. So as you know, I, I got the 360 because I went before Eddie. And it just kind of worked out, but it was really cool working with those guys. Yeah, it was a fun commercial. Those were certainly our, some of our earliest memories was that commercial. Yep. We had wetsuits on underneath our uniforms because that water was so cold. Oh, for real? Yeah. Wow. And only one shot, too. You hit the jump. I mean, one time. That's it. You know, pressure was on. Remember where that lake is or where it was filmed? Um. You know, we sometimes we're at Universal Studios. Sometimes we were out on a site. You know, it was all kind of in that general area. Sometimes um, I did a Wrangler commercial. It was out, I don't know. I can't remember exactly, but it was all out in the valley, all out in that Hollywood area kind of. Okay, I'm going to hit on the death one first. And when I die, 
I want my word to be intact. I want to know that I didn't break my word to anybody. That's very important to me. Um, trust, trusting, you know, people that I trust, um, few and far between, but very important to me. I just want to know that I didn't do anybody wrong and um, I help people. I like helping people, you know. Sure. Um, yes. So, and if I'm laying in my, you know, I could die right now in this experience I'm going through with you guys for all these years. I know it's been off and on, but um, I die a happy man. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, you know, as a pastor, I, I tend to eventually lead into uh, that that area. You have a friend in me. If that's something you ever want to discuss, I'm, I'm your I'm your club homeboy for that. <laughs> you know, I don't know if you feel this, but it feels like you and I have been friends a long time. Longer yeah, than we've been talking online. Yeah. You know, I was, um, just to kind of segue, I, I don't know if you remember this, but it's been, I don't know, four, four months or so, you had actually commented on one of my um, YouTube videos. I think it was the build of the 22 behind me. And I know you're not supposed to text and drive. Maybe that leads towards a death conversation. <laughs> I'm going to assume that I was at a stoplight. And I get a ping on my phone, and it says R.L. Osborne commented on your video, and, and you said something like, um, great job, um, keep up the good work. I don't know, something like that. I have to go back and look at it. I'm surprised it's not on the bathroom wall by this point. But And, and my response, because I didn't want to come across as being some creeper, you know, it's like, you know, thanks for commenting. You do really good work too, or something. <laughs> but uh, you know, that's that's kind of how we, uh, you know, that's the first time that I, I had seen your name having any connection to me. And then you friended me on Facebook, and then you might remember that I reached out to you very very early on for the sake of I don't want to say helping you, but I I just you know I'm a I'm a veteran to social media and I knew that you weren't and I knew the sharks would come out and um, mm -hmm. the, our our listeners may find this interesting that until today you and I have never talked to BMX no um, but you know first of all I love the sharks and the skeptics and all that because they it's in, it just keeps it exciting you know but that's funny because the first time I remember even seeing you was when you had taken Dominic's picture out of the one of me and Duke, and all I said was, just go with it. <laughs> that was the first thing he said with me, man. Just go with it. I'm like, this sounds like fun, and that was a good time. <laughs> I'm like, this guy's kind of cool. Yeah. And, and, then, and then we just talk uh, pressure washing, which is my business. And, and right. Clean, you know? <laughs> right. I enjoy those conversations, talking shop. You know, I learned a lot. This the picture is kind of fading. Does it look like it's getting lighter? I don't like the, the, the lighting. Something. It's all right. Yeah, I think once, Mike, I said to you, um, I, I proposed a joke to you. you and did. Yeah, and like usually no, people are like, what? I don't know what you're talking. What? What do you want me to do? And you're like, I got it. <laughs> I'll take care of it. You're like on. You had it figured out. It was cool. <laughs> we, have, we have that connection. Yeah. We? Sure. Who was your idol as a kid? We idolized you. Who did you idolize? Probably Bob Hanna. Oh, wow. Sure. Motocross guys, man. Ricky yeah. Johnson, Jeremy McGrath, Bob Hanna, Brock Glover. All those guys are kind of my heroes. Jeff Ward. And then all the guys in BMX, too. All the BMX pros, too. Uh, second question. Boxers or briefs? What are briefs? <laughs> I wear Calvin Klein uh, Calvin Klein I don't know you know they're they're not they're longer underwear okay. they're longer they're not like you know the little ball grabbers but they're huh okay Dylan says Dylan says boxer briefs <laughs> Uh, briefs. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> uh, you're not as cool as we thought, mate. 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, RL, long hair or short hair back in the day? Long hair, man. Okay. You mean, did I like it? Yeah. I liked long hair because women liked long hair, so it was a good thing. That could segue into some conversation, I'm sure. And you know, uh, back, you know, when I was writing like Soledad Sands, like David Clinton time and Tom Lund and uh, Stewart and actually Bob Hanna raced out at Soledad Sands. He raced BMX. A lot of guys. Um, long hair, man. We all had long hair. You know, everybody wore puka shells, long hair. And then we started racing um, at a different, that was the NBA. And then we started racing at Western sports Arama, which is like Greg Hill territory. And uh, the Dirk brothers uh, or Dirk David Al brothers. And um, they were a little more clean cut. They had long hair, a little bit long hair, but a little more clean cut. And the guys in Soledad, we were a little more like ratty. And I've kind of, yeah. I've kind of always been ratty. I'm always been kind of a Soledad type of guy. You're, you're the ratty one. Yep. Okay. Um, Redline general or bully? In what favorite? Yeah. Mm, probably Redline general, then bully. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, here's another one. Ramp, flat, or street? Man, street's really fun. Um, I love flat. Flat is like, man, that's that's just what I really have my heart at. Street's good. Hurts more though. Ramp hurts a lot more. But I love riding dirt jumps. I've been. I was riding skate parks and dirt jumps like a year ago. Um. So. Yeah, we're anxious to see some video of that. Well, I think most of us just discovered this. It was actually cool, you know. Um, I started riding dirt jumps, and and it was nice because I could go ride, and nobody knew anything about me. I was just a rider, and that, that was always one of my dreams, um, not to have people looking at you, expecting. And it was cool. I could go ride, and I'd meet these sixteen-year-old kids. I'd meet sixty-year-old men. I'd all kinds of people that would just we just shared the sport, you know. It was cool. They did not know who I was. Wow. And do you ride with a helmet? Uh, on, on dirt jumps or a yes. skate park, I wear a full face helmet all the time. I'd be dead right now if it I didn't does, wear a does, full face. That question, yeah. yeah. Um, favorite band of all time? Zeppelin. Somebody just said that in the background, Zeppelin. No question. Um, Jimmy Page. Jimmy Page. <laughs> who was your toughest competitor? Uh, racing? No, um, freestyle. Any, any, any freestyle. Well, I'm gonna, if I could say racing, Greg Hill in the 12 year old class was. Greg Hill in the 12 year old class. Yeah, we, we own the 12 year old class. And man, he had. The one thing I hated about Greg was he put on the back of his pants that said, You lose. Yes. And that was the only reason why I wanted to beat him because if I went across the finish line, I had to read his pants. I felt like he was direct. I know he was directing it at me, and I hated that. So, but he was a clean racer, man. He was extremely fast and strong and clean. Uh, I had a good where, time. Where, where did that come from? Putting putting your name or something iconic on the back of your pants. I mean, you had uh, what was it? Set. set. Yeah, you had set. Yeah. With, with the dollar sign. Right. Yeah. That was before I lost everything. <laughs> I was sad at that time. A couple of years later, it wasn't that way, but. <laughs> you can take, take it off after a while. Yeah. So you were sad. Very, very cool. Um, so your toughest competitor in freestyle, who, who was the guy who you hoped would not, that, that maybe their plane was late or whatever? Well, Dennis McCoy was, man, he he could ride like he rode in the street. He could ride that way in a contest, you know. Rick Molinturno, um was really good. Woody, Martin. Um, and we were, whether they want to admit this or not, we were all glad that Kevin Jones didn't go pro. Oh, sure. No doubt. That was like a gift from God. We all knew yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, Kevin Jones is amazing. Yeah, he is. You know, I you know what I was thinking about him the other day. You know, these guys, 
the new riders are doing these nose manuals on their front wheel. It, you know, they're standing on their pedals, gliding on their front wheel. And I, I'm not, I kid you not. I remember being, I don't think I hallucinated this, but I was watching Rick do his run right before me. And I swear to God, he came out and did a nose wheel on his pedals about 50 feet. Right. Just gliding. And I was just like, man, I, I couldn't believe I saw that. I was like, I had to put it out of my head so I could go do my run. But, man, that's way back then he was doing that. That's crazy. So that's flat. What about Ram? Who was the toughest, toughest guy? Mike, well, in the early days, Mike Buff really pushed me. Mike was pretty nutty. He, he would ride off roofs, drop into heavy bowls. He pushed me a lot. Um, but when... Um, you know, when Eddie Fiola and Blyther and Dominguez, a guy named Steve Bennett, what, man, he was so good. Good guitar player, too. When those guys came on the scene, it was like they were progressing so fast it was hard to keep up with. Sure, sure. Uh, you mentioned Mike Buff. I have here as a question for Speed Round for, uh, for your, your partner, who would be Mike Buff or Ron Wilton? For my partner? Yeah. Uh, Ronnie and I got along really good and Ronnie was Ronnie was super smooth and here's what I learned from Ronnie we're sitting at breakfast and I was trying always looking for energy and Ronnie turned up the sugar upside down that bit those big sugar things and I swear it was like 10 minutes that thing was dumping into his coffee I'm like what are you doing man and he's like I don't know it tastes good and I'm like, well, all right, he goes, try it. So I did it. And I was like, wow, my energy level went through the roof. So, and he also did, uh, he did pizza from Domino's, pepperoni pizza with jalapenos. And man, I, I got, those things would just ripped me apart, but they tasted really good. Um, so Ronnie Wilton was really good to tour with. Mike Buff was so entertaining. Two totally different things. Mike was great. Winkle was great. Chris Rothrock, Todd Anderson, Ronnie Wilton. Um, I'm probably forgetting a few people. They were all just Seppi Mays, Craig Grosso. They were just really good, all of them. That's awesome. Very good. Quality information. Um, I have one more question for you. And uh, you can do whatever you want to after that. And, uh, um, but let me say, first of all, thank you for the opportunity this is a dream come true for me. Uh, I, I can't really put into words how much I appreciate just the opportunity to talk to you and, and be your friend and be a friend to you. Um, so, so having the opportunity says says that um, you are human and uh, you're down to earth. You, you are humble. The, the fact that you don't admit that says that you are humble. But thank you. We, we greatly appreciate it. I do have one more question for you, though. Thank you for saying that. If I pay all your expenses, would you come to Ohio and have a sleepover with me? Just <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to need a few more details on that. <laughs> well, Dylan's coming with me. He's going to go everywhere with me. I, I can't hardly think without him anymore. He's controlled. <laughs> I'm sure we will... Uh, be by your house at some point. Uh, we do put on our local show in September. I don't know if that's going to happen this year to show a swap meet, old school thing. And uh, if we could work that out, that's that's just kind of a, an extra there. But man, we would myself and a host of others across the world would love to, to see that happen. But um, uh, yeah, maybe that can happen someday. And you, you always have an invite to uh, Cincinnati, Dayton. We love you here, man. We love you. Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. And um, let me just say, it, it's a it's a true honor to talk to you guys. And, and you know, I've been out of this for a long time. I've been out of it for a long time. And you, who do you think has been keeping this sport alive? Can you answer that? Well, I, I think I know where you're going with that. It, it's certainly the, those who continue on in the fans. How about you and those guys in that room right there? Right. Yeah. So... Yeah, well, that's the truth, man. And then, you know, when I went on Facebook and you guys welcomed me back in, it was it's cool, man. I, I, I look at us all as friends and um, I just enjoy everything that transfers between us. And um, 
Dylan and Pat and I will definitely be on the road eventually. We're just kind of getting used to all this and figuring it out, you know? Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Once again, you have a friend in us. And uh, like I said, there's 12, 13 of us who are going to go on a ride here in just a moment. I have a feeling that we'll be talking about a lot of this. And uh, from all of us to you, thank you very much, brother. Hey, man, it's my my uh, honor to do it. And um, Pat and Dylan feel the same way about this. So, um, yeah, I hope you guys have a nice ride, and I'll be thinking about you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Dylan. Thank you, Hey, Aurel. thank you for all you guys do, man. We really appreciate it. You guys hey, are awesome. Mike, I got to tell you, though, when um, – you and um, Mark mm -hmm. were dying the grips because yep. he's a, he's a tall guy, right? He's really tall. You kept yeah, commenting. Generally speaking, in any group that I'm in, he's they're, they're the tall guy. But yeah, go ahead. And you're like, I don't know if this is working. They're not really changing color. And that, while you were saying that, you were just dumping like the whole dye bottle into that thing. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that was funny. You're you're a funny guy. I don't know if you know this, but you're what just watching you walk across the yard makes me laugh. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Yeah. That's some good stuff. <laughs> Your express, <laughs> it was like that one time you go, I hate Mondays. And um, you posted that picture and some guy goes, oh, man, this is bad. This is really bad. That was funny. <laughs> uh, it's awesome. Thank yeah. you for taking notice. That, that uh, uh, very humbling to me. Yeah, you're easy to talk to. You're a good interviewer, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah great job. Can you're you handle really all job. those compliments all at once? Is that too much? Well, when, when no one else gives them, I give them to myself. So okay. <laughs> I learned to appreciate them. Uh, we, we need one another, don't we? And, and as we get older, we, we learn how much we need one another. And, yes. And, um, yeah. Yes. The, the day may come when you, once again, need to hit the eject button. If that day comes, so be it. We're enjoying the time that we have with you. And um, we, we hold our friendship truly uh, as uh, a gift. Thank you. Thank you, and and just know that we do too, and I do especially. Um, and yeah, I'm 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 just having a great time with you guys. Made a lot of friends. Very very cool. Okay. Thank you. We'll, we'll turn it over to Dylan. Okay, man. <laughs> Dylan. What? He said you want you on here. Oh, he does. Yeah, it's tech, <laughs> tech time. Uh, tech time. Hey, I gotta tell you guys, man. I this you guys went about as far, or I went as far as I could. Um, on Facebook and I was struggling with that and Dylan all this other stuff these computers and talking with you and everything this is Dylan yeah I mean big shout he's out to Dylan yeah man, man he's I mean, really doing it oh my goodness thank you great job it's and awesome Pat's like my psychiatrist he helps me through <laughs> all my problems in the truck we talk he's a good he gives me good uh, you know good uh, he keeps me Gives me good ideas, grounded ideas, you know. To start a truck series. Yeah. <laughs> so anyways, Mike, <laughs> thanks for taking the time and good to see you guys. Say hi to everybody and here's Dylan. <laughs>